Hercules. You've probably heard its name in passing, you might have even seen it in the skies, but for most of us, we don't actually know much about the plane. It's really not the first name that comes to mind when you think of badass plane, but it absolutely should be. And in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you why. Welcome to another episode of Airplane Anatomy, a series on my channel where I break down different airplanes from their history to their engineering to how they fly. And today in episode 15, we'll be talking about the C-130 Hercules, better known as the Herc. Now it's kind of hard to describe exactly what the Hercules does. I mean, it's a cargo, troop transport, medvac, gunship, assault, search and rescue, <gasps> weather reconnaissance, aerial refueling, patrolling, firefighting, aerial delivery playing, among others. So maybe it's a little faster to describe it as everything but a fighter. And thanks to its extreme versatility, the Herc, a plane designed back in the 50s, is still in operation with over 70 countries today. The C-130 is also known for its short takeoff and landings, especially on makeshift airstrips. And in the air, its four iconic turboprop engines give it 50% further range than most of its predecessors. So how does the Hercules fly like a cargo jet, deal damage like a bomber, and react like a fighter? Well, stay tuned. Let's go back to the 50s. After the Korean War, the US quickly realized that they needed a new aircraft to transport troops. It took the army six weeks to move two divisions from the US to Korea by sea. Not great for response time. They very quickly found out that the World War II piston engine transport aircraft like the C-47 Skytrain and the C-119 flying boxcars weren't really enough. They just didn't have the payload or the range. And on top of this, traditional two-engine aircraft had a fatal flaw. And that was if they lost one engine, especially on takeoff, it would be very difficult to stay in the air when fully loaded. And even four-engine aircraft like the C-124 weren't much better either since their climb rates would be capped at just 50 feet per minute even if they just lost one engine. So the US government laid out some requirements for this new transport aircraft, like it needed to hold a capacity of 92 passengers in a cargo compartment at least 12 meters long. But more importantly, it needed to be able to land on dirt roads, icy surfaces, and all types of makeshift airstrips. And the company Lockheed came up with an aircraft design that was able to meet all of those requirements, called the XC-130. Their design was economical and practical, although not exactly beautiful. Its resemblance to ironing boards glued onto a fuselage was a far deviation from the sleek outlines and the smooth curves of traditional Lockheed aircraft. In fact, after preliminary designs of the C-130 were shown to Kelly Johnson, chief aircraft architect and designer of various Lockheed icons like the SR-71 Blackbird, he said, if you sign that proposal for the Hercules, it will destroy the Lockheed company. Thankfully, Lockheed decided to still proceed with the bid and ended up winning the contract, maybe because there was just something special about this soccer mom van of the skies. Now we can't talk about the C-130 without talking about its four T-56 turboprop engines. Now although turboprops are extremely common today, the Hercules was actually one of the very first turboprop planes to enter production. The standard at that time were piston engines, which are internal combustion engines that uses reciprocating pistons to convert pressure into a rotational motion and driving the propellers. Now this is most commonly seen today in a lot of general aviation aircraft, like Cessnas, for example. On the other hand, turboprop engines, like the ones on the C-130, are a form of the modern turbojet engine. Now, turboprop, as the name implies, consists of a gas generator turbine and a propeller. And turboprops were much more fuel efficient than piston engines, allowing for vastly improved ranges to meet the US military's demands. And at the same time, this giant upgrade in engine power also allowed turboprop aircraft like the C-130 to take off from much shorter runways. But not only that, despite the fact that turboprop engines are more complex, they actually have less moving parts, resulting in a more smoother and vibration-free motion. And this resulted in much higher reliability, but lowered maintenance overall. 
Now there are two types of turboprop engines, free turbine and single shaft. Free turbine engines consist of a gas generator turbine that blows its exhaust through a second turbine that in turn drives the propeller. Since the two turbines are not connected, they spin independently. On the other hand, single shaft engines like the ones on the C-130 has their gas generator turbine connected directly to drive the propellers. And in this case, the two turbines will spin at two constant speeds. And when pilots require more power, the speed of the propellers doesn't change, but instead the pitch of the blades change to pull in more air. So with the single shaft T-56 engine and hydraulic flight controls, which were pretty innovative for that time, pilots experienced almost no delay between yanking on a yoke to the aircraft engine's response. And because of this reason, C-130s can accelerate almost instantaneously, unlike even a lot of other fighter aircraft at that time. And just in case it wasn't clear how big of an upgrade these turboprop engines really were, the C-130 could fly on just one engine alone, making it one of the most overpowered aircraft in history. Now, a few years after the production of the initial C-130A model, a B variant was built with slight upgrades, including increased fuel capacity using auxiliary fuel tanks built into the wings and a slightly improved engine. And to increase lift generation, flight control surfaces were allowed to make more extreme deflections. Now, normally such extreme angles would cause airflow separation, but this was minimized on the C-130Bs with a new system that would blow high pressure air over the flight control surfaces during slow flights. And this blown air system was incredibly effective at lowering landing speeds. It cut down the landing distance by over half. However, it was only able to improve the takeoff performance marginally. So unfortunately, the system never entered into service because the performance improvement was kind of useless if the plane couldn't take off from where it landed. And a couple of the C-130Bs were also converted into electronic reconnaissance planes, designated C-130B2s. Now the B2s have their telltale external fuel tanks, except they're not actually fuel tanks, but disguised radar receiver antennas. Antennae? Antennas. And the C-130E variant was later developed as a longer range version of the B model with some structural and avionics upgrades as well. And the MC-130E Combat Talon was later developed for the Air Force during the Vietnam War for low-level penetration missions for special operations. They were used for what is called the Fulton Surface-to-Air Recovery System, also known as STARS, to extract cargo and personnel on the ground without the aircraft ever having to land. And how would it do this without stopping, you might ask? Well, the system works by first attaching a helium balloon with a lift line to the package. The plane would then fly by and try to catch that line with its giant scissor-shaped grappling hook at the nose of the plane. And just in case it missed, there are also lines extending from the nose of the plane to each wingtip to protect the propellers from getting caught up in the lift string. But if successful, the cargo would now be yanked off the ground with a force less than that of an opening parachute and start trailing behind the aircraft through the air. Crew members at the rear cargo door would then hook the snagged line to a hydraulic winch and pull the attached cargo into the aircraft. But unfortunately, in 1982, a soldier fell to the ground as he was being lifted up and died from his injuries. And as a result, the star system is no longer in use and has been uninstalled from every MC-130E since. Now, there are many, many more variants of the C-130 that has been modified for special missions. These include the AC-130 gunship, also developed during the Vietnam War, the HC-130 long-range search and rescue aircraft operated by the US Air Force and Coast Guard, the C-130R and the C-130T naval versions with external fuel tanks under the wings, the RC-130 reconnaissance plane, and a civilian version called the L-100. The Hercules took its first flight in August of 1954, and in the 66 years it's been in service ever since, it's really lived up to its original design of versatility, having completed a variety of different missions. 
Its four powerful turboprop engines allow us to take off using only 800 feet. Now for reference, it only requires half the takeoff distance as a Boeing 737, both fully loaded to its maximum takeoff weight, despite the fact that the Hercules is 40% heavier. And with its impressive short takeoff and landing capabilities, the Hercules still holds the record for the largest and heaviest aircraft to have ever landed on an aircraft carrier after breaking the record in 1963. And its very unique aircraft nose has 23 windows, which allows its flight crew to see their entire surroundings, especially useful in unfamiliar and unprepared landing zones, like war zones or even Antarctica. Now it's able to accomplish this mainly thanks to its landing gear with tires that are very large and low pressured, similar to off-road tires. They're also mounted in tandem pairs, one in front of the other, so that the front wheel can compact the soft ground into a flat surface for the next tire to roll through. But maybe you don't get too excited at the idea of getting to fly on a Herc, because a Canadian journalist once described its red net seats. Red net. Because a Canadian journalist once described its neck net. <laughs> because a Canadian journalist once described its red net. <laughs> red. N red net. Not redneck. <laughs> Maybe it's redneck. <laughs> Because a Canadian journalist once described its red net seats as so uncomfortable they must have been designed that way. But the C-130 is one of the safest aircraft to have ever been designed, with just one crash every 250,000 flight hours over 40 years. And to date, there have been over 70 variants created, with more than 2,400 C-130s made. So let's talk about the most recent variants, and also where the Herc line might go from here. The newest C-130 variant, and the only one still in production, is the C-130J, the Super Hercules. Now while it's aesthetically pretty similar to the original models, the Super Hercules had some major upgrades, including much more advanced Rolls-Royce engines, digital avionics, and it only requires a crew of three to operate as opposed to five after the flight engineer and navigator were both replaced by computers. And these improvements resulted in 40% greater range, 20% higher maximum speed, and a 40% shorter takeoff distance from its most recent predecessor, the C-130E. The Super Herc has a flyaway cost of around 75 million in 2021, and is currently in operation with the Air Force of 23 countries around the world. Now back in October of 2010, the US Air Force issued a request for the development of a new aircraft to replace the C-130s, with the requirement of carrying 190% greater payload and the capability to carry out Mounted Vertical Maneuver or MVM missions. In a variety of different aircrafts, including traditional fixed-wing aircraft, helicopters, tilt rotors, rotorcraft, and even airships are being considered, although production isn't expected to begin until at least 2030. And remember, that's in aviation time. So guys, that was a little backstory to the C-130 Hercules. What did you guys think about the plane? Now, I was actually very looking forward to doing this video because I know a lot of people like to focus on the fast fighters and the cool reconnaissance planes, but not a lot of love is given to really versatile and practical aircraft like the C-130 Hercules. But I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. I also had a great time diving deeper into the types of different jet engines so that might be a future video topic coming up so stay tuned for that but if you enjoyed this video please make sure to give it a thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to my channel to catch new videos just like this one but that's it from me I'll see you guys next time